We are weary, we are weak, and we are watching. We are watching because we trust that the God who comes is coming still. We are watching because even in a topsy-turvy year where it is so easy to lose your bearings, we remember our North Star and his advent in our midst. So we gather to hear the old, old story of the coming of Christ one more time. To remind ourselves that in his birth, everything changed. And in his resurrection life, everything will be changed. So we watch and wait and light the four outside candles of the Advent wreath one last time. The first candle reminds us of our hope. The second candle is the candle of peace. The third candle represents our joy. And the fourth candle is for love, our love of God and God's love for us. We now light the center candle, the Christ candle. Christ is our Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us now, and because of that, we will be with him forever.
please join me in the prayer of confession. We pray, O Lord, purify our hearts, that they may be ready to be your dwelling place. Let us never fail to find room for you. Come and abide in us, that we also may abide in you, who were born into the world for us, you who live and reign, King of kings and Lord of lords, now and forevermore. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. It is this light that shines on us this evening, this life that springs up in our midst. Believe this good news and live in its peace.
A reading from Isaiah 9, verses 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder for the yoke of their burden, and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, 
There were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around to them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Sure. 
Well, Merry Christmas, church. We hear once again those words from Pastor Ralph, that familiar story from the events long ago in and around Bethlehem. I have had the remarkable fortune of getting to walk in those fields and hills around Bethlehem. Now, you probably don't have to think too hard about the benefits of that kind of experience. But there are at least a couple of drawbacks, one of which is that all of the mental images of lush pastures that I had as a child when I read about shepherds, well, those had to be revised in a pretty drastic way. The fields and hills around Bethlehem are rocky. They're often dry. They are exposed to harsh wind, and to beating sun. The hill country of Judea is what farmers and ranchers of an earlier time would call hard scrabble. If you're not careful, you can read Luke 2 and blow right past the line that informs you there were, in that region, shepherds living in those fields. They might have been some of the few people with worse living conditions than Mary that night. But like Mary, they had not given themselves over to sleep. They were wide awake, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Because in that unforgiving landscape, the animals of their flock were not the only creatures lurking around in the evening light. The shepherds were there to provide for their flock. They were also there to protect them from any threat that may come. They traveled alongside them. They slept among them. They watched over them. They cared for them. And when necessary, they fought for them. How fitting that these would be the first witnesses to the little baby who would grow to be known as the Good Shepherd, the one who would do all those same things for his sheep. They saved their flock from all harm, those shepherds, but they found themselves still in need of a Savior. And on this night, one was given to them. We are told that they were paralyzed with fear as an angel of the Lord appeared and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. Before the message came through loud and clear, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing to you good news of great joy for all people. Because to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. What? 
an immeasurable gift. Having lived close to the earth, you know, being involved in the stuff of life and death, these shepherds get to be the very first witnesses to the true light in life that was coming into the world. They couldn't bring gold or frankincense or myrrh, but they could bring what they had, a witness, a testimony, a story for little Mary of the message they had received of divine peace come into the world through her child. And Luke says that that gift Mary treasured within her heart. We're told that the shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just like it had been told to them. But I wonder what they did next. I wonder if they went back out to gather up their sheep or their goats, whatever they were shepherding that night that had started to drift away while they were in town. I wonder if they worked to arrange the stones on that rocky landscape to create a smooth, flat spot to catch up on some sleep after all the excitement. I wonder if anybody noticed a change in them. We, of course, are left to our imagination with such questions. Because having played their part in the story for Luke's purposes, they exit stage right and are not heard from again. I like to imagine that their daily tasks looked exactly the same, but that they themselves were changed. I mean, how could they not? They had just been let in on a secret that the rest of the world was going to have to wait decades to learn about. What kind of purpose must those shepherds have felt as they went back out to watch, not just over their flocks that night, but also over a young woman who carried with her the Savior of the world? Despite all the challenges that they faced as shepherds, as people living under military occupation, as fallible humans who lived subject to sin, they now possessed hope. And that makes all the difference. The end was quite literally in sight for them. It isn't hard to imagine that... um, the people that those shepherds interacted with after their encounter with Jesus would have noticed something different about them. Perhaps they emitted a sort of confident joy that made everything just a little bit easier, seem a little bit brighter. Maybe the afterglow of that one night lasted for days or weeks. Dare we even think it sustained them for months. Maybe even years for, to come. Maybe they were changed in such a way that carried them through all of their days, which makes me wonder how many days they were given after that night. I wonder if any of those shepherds showed up as older men to hear Jesus speak in Jerusalem once his ministry began. I wonder if they ever grabbed a sacred, private moment with him to say, you know what? I knew your father. I know your mother. In fact, I was there the night you were born. And angels told us you were going to do great things. And we are so proud of what you've begun, Jesus. Keep it up. Yeah, probably not, right? But isn't it fun to imagine? 
something we don't need to imagine, but we can observe instead, is how you and I are impacted by meeting Jesus as the hope of the world and the source of peace on earth. Do people recognize anything different about you? Because you have come to know Jesus as the promise of God's salvation. I've thought about some version of that question a lot throughout 2020. We are drawing to the end of a year that has brought so much ugliness to the forefront. At times, it has been so easy to see division and fear with so little graciousness in the mix. Were the people of God different this year? Were we able to take the high road above the fray? Did we who claim Jesus arise and shine in the darkness because we knew that our light had come? You would like to think that the afterglow of that divine date in Bethlehem never faded for the shepherds. But if our lives are any clue, it probably did. They knew that their true king had come, but it would be years before he took his throne, and even then, not in a way anybody expected. Likewise, we can know that Christ is the Prince of Peace, whose rule will have no end. But how often do we feel anxious and angry and bereft of peace about the stuff in this world? Pandemic fatigue, election losses, economic uncertainty, that weird clicking noise in the wheel well of your car every time you turn left. Today we pause to listen. If we can tune out enough of the static around us and stop thinking that, ah, we've already heard this story before, we might be able to receive one more time the amazing message that to us as well is born on this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. It's a message that reminds us that even though there is so much wrong in this world, it does not serve us well to grow overwhelmed by it. We may not see the fullness of the kingdom of God yet, but it is coming. Maybe that news can help us hold on to peace among those whom God favors. If just for tonight. Maybe it will produce an afterglow in us that is recognizable to others for the next day or two. Maybe for a couple weeks. Dare we hope that we could be experienced as a people of light and peace, not just in Christmas season, but in this year to come, uncertain though it may be. Who is to say? Tomorrow, the fields and flocks that we care for will call us back to life as usual. But tonight, we can simply look with wonder and with awe as we receive the gift of God for the redemption of this world.
The House of Christmas by G.K. Chesterton. There fared a mother driven forth out of an inn to Rome. In the place where she was homeless, all men are at home. The crazy stable close at hand with shaking timber and shifting sand grew a stronger thing to abide and stand than the square stones of Rome. For men are homesick in their homes and strangers under the sun, and they lay on their heads in a foreign land whenever the day is done. Here we have battle and blazing eyes, and chance and honor and high surprise. But our homes are under miraculous skies where the Yule tale was begun. A child in a foul stable where the beasts feed and foam. Only where he was homeless are you and I at home. We have hands that fashion and heads that know, but our hearts we lost how long ago. In a place no chart nor ship can show, under the sky's dome. This world is wild as an old wife's tale, and strange the plain things are. The earth is enough and the air is enough for our wonder and our war. But our rest is as far as the fire drake swings, and our peace is put in impossible things. Where clashed and thundered unthinkable wings, round an incredible star. To an open house in the evening, home shall men come. To an older place than Eden, and a taller town than Rome. To the end of the way of the wandering star, to the things that cannot be, and that are. To the place where God was homeless, and all men are at home. We celebrate Christmas at the end of a year where it seems like there has been so much darkness in a way that we could not anticipate. We needed the light to come this year. And our hearts are heavy because we are used to gathering together in this sacred space to pass the Christmas light person to person, neighbor to neighbor, brother and sister in Christ to one another. And God willing, next year we will do that once again. But we remember that every year, the light we pass is not ours, but it is the light of Christ, which has come into this world to bring light and life for all people. And so, we invite you at home, if you have a candle to light, a flashlight to turn on, a Christmas tree to illuminate, to join us in bringing some light into this evening, into carrying the Christ light with us into all that the year ahead holds.
<laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, church. Good Yule. Feliz Navidad. Joyeux Noel. Fröhliche Weihnachten. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas from the Robrons! We wish you a Merry Christmas. I'm not allowed to have candles in my apartment, so don't tell too many people that I'm doing this. But Merry Christmas.